Hey guys, my name is Frank and this is my workshop. Hey guys, welcome back to the shop. Uh, this is going to be episode three of the um, Cup Cadet Dozer build. Um, in episode two, we stripped the two tractors, a 1450 and a 1210, down to their frames and rear ends and front axles. So this is what we've got right now. This is the frame for the 1210. Um, it's got an aluminum rear end in it, so we're not going to use this rear end but we are going to use the, the frame and then this is the frame from the 1450 and this has a ported ported hydro so it has auxiliary hydraulics on it so that's what we'll use for the hydraulics um, these couple of boards on here just to support the frame when I we cut the, the front axle off and then here in the middle I've got a support frame that will set the axle, the frames on. This is on casters, so um, this will support the the tractor as we build it. So um, the the frames will span this. Um, I didn't really take many measurements, but hopefully it'll it'll fit. I did measure the height so that the wheels will be off the ground. Um, anyway, so that's my first first cut at a support um, so we can move this move the welded together frame around as we work on it so the the first thing I need to do um, on these two tractors is um, remove the front axles and wheels and stack them aside so um, we're get we can get ready and cut the cut the frames all right, so we'll go ahead and get started with that.
All right, there's the 12 tens frame cut. Um, this brace here um, is not, not straight in the frame. I cut the frame with the same spot based on the spacing of holes, um, but this cross member is not straight. So I wind up cutting it, cutting it completely out. We don't need it. All right, let's uh, look at the 1450s frame.
All right, so that's a 3 16 inch pin, which held the axle pivot pin in place. I'm beginning to align the two frame halves. I'm using um, a couple pieces of um, angle iron clamped to the rails. They gotta be clamped in two dimensions, two directions this way. I'll hold them together this way and then height wise, so width and height um, on both sides of the cut. And you can see the cut is open by um, three eighths or half an inch. So on both sides, you can see over here is open as well. Uh, this rail, this um, reinforcement piece, which held the steering knuckle, the steering gearbox um, on the 1210. This is the 1210. This is the 1450. Anyway, um, this has got to come out. It's going to create an interference here. Um, I can't get the frames together without cutting this out. So I, I wasn't sure how it was going to work out. The placement is different on these two frames. You can see on the 1450, this reinforcement is set back from the cut line by half an inch on um, the 1210. Cut, cutting the frame at the same place, this was in a different spot. So it's a half an inch, well, almost an inch further forward on the frame compared to compared to this one. So anyway, I'm going to cut this out and then we'll pull the two frame halves together and um, and tack weld them. Okay, using the clamp, I was able to pull the two frames together. They're pretty close. Let me tighten up the clamps on the angle iron. So that gives me a good clean area to run a bead here 
and then I will weld on a reinforcement angle underneath um, that will reinforce the, the frame there. I don't expect this frame to take a lot of loads. The stresses from the dozer blade will be transferred to a frame which supports the tracks. So at this point, this particular frame is basically just to hold the transmissions in line, hold the engine, seat, um, hood and cowl, basically um, the operator portion of the dozer. So structural strength in this particular weld is not critical. I mean, you don't want it to come apart, obviously, but it won't be taking major, um, major loads. The loads from pushing dirt with the blade, the blade support arms are going to come back, at least in my current plan, come back to the frame which supports the tracks. And so that'll be a separate frame that we will build that will have cross pieces which will run under this frame um, side to side. In any case, um, we're prepped here to um, run a bead or partial bead on this joint on both sides. The angle iron has the, the frames aligned. Al alignment's not critical here really, um, but it's, it's pretty close at this point. And um, we'll tack these together with a couple of one inch tacks. Um, don't need a full weld at this point, but I don't want just a little tack because it'll come apart. Um, we're going to be moving it around, so. Okay, come back in a minute with the welder. I had my mic turned off there for the first part of that bead. Let's go around the other side. Let's move around to the other side and tack that off. Actually, I ran a couple inch long bead. Um, I think it's in a good position, so I'm not so much worried about I ran a couple inch bead on the other side I know I said I was just I was going to tack it but I think the position is good so I'm not too concerned about having to you know, take it apart. So, um, and just just looking from the back side, I've got good penetration. I I had it set on setting four. This is a Hobart one handler 140. So I think on position four, it's 140 amps, and I'm feeding about. 
50 inches, 40 inches per minute on the wire feed. It's um, uh, 030, 030, 30 mil wire, 030 wire. All right, let's put a bit, put a bit of weld on this side. The fit of the two frame halves is a little bit better on this side than on the other side, so I'm not trying to fill a gap as much. That should be enough to hold it. Um, we'll be able to finish welding it. We can take the um, angle iron off and finish welding that up and apply the reinforcement um, to the bottom.
so that gives us the first bead on the joint between the turn my welder off the first bead on the joint between the frames uh, I was pretty happy with the alignment so I went ahead and just um, ran a bead up both both sides of the frame so uh, that'll hold that'll certainly hold together um, you know it's got pretty good penetration I was running it pretty hot um, had a little bit of trouble with burn through at one spot I mean since it's only um, probably 12 gauge I mean it's less than eighth of it's maybe eighth of an inch um, steel so there was one spot where I, I had a little bit of burn through but I was able to fill that in I cut the um, power down uh, on the welder to position three I don't remember what the amp rating is for the various positions on here um, obviously it's not made for um, anyway it's a consumer grade welder obvious grade welder so um, got a heavy bead on both sides of that so we're good to go we'll let that cool and then we'll move on to um, mounting this in our movable frame and then uh, to support it while we work on it and I'm looking at the foot pedals and I think they're coming off so don't know I may keep the shafts in here which turn when you hit the pedal because I may may want to use them since they're connected to the hydro linkage I may have a use for them so I may leave the leave them in here but I don't really at this point see a need for the pedals themselves I mean it's they're not going to be of any use so at this point I think um, the pedals are coming off I'll probably just do that off camera I just cut the cut them right here le leaving the shaft inside this collar I'll just cut the cut the shaft off right here and uh, on both sides just get the pedals out of the way okay um, bring you back in a few minutes I'm getting ready to work on the transmissions for uh, this project the dozer and I just wanted to uh, give you a little bit of insight into the work that needs to be done before we get started and I've got um, the transmission that will go and be used to replace this aluminum transmission on um, this end of the frame and I think it's it's one of the dilemmas I've been dealing with is maintaining proper rotation of the inputs to the transmissions and then orientation of the transmission so the input to these hydrostats has to be counterclockwise for it to operate correctly um, it's possible that a these are sun strand um, hydrostats there it's possible that other versions on other equipment could be operated clockwise but in the case these are operated only counterclockwise and from what I understand from a guy who used to work in the uh, Sun Strand um, shop is that the way the valve plates are milled in these um, hydrostats there's really no way to run them clockwise so they have to be run counterclockwise now that creates a little bit of a problem if they face each other so this one needs to be counterclockwise as well well of course if there's a shaft connecting the two then that doesn't work this one would be counterclockwise this one would wind up being clockwise which it can't be run clockwise now fortunately these all have another shaft on the rear so this is another input shaft and then maybe you can see it better on on this one 
it um, is a 5 8 inch shaft it has a quarter inch um, hole in it for a pin and you can put a coupler just like this on it or any kind of coupler and you can drive it from this side as well the shaft here goes all the way through so if you drive this one clockwise then it turns out to be the input going counterclockwise so the solution to drive both hydrostats correctly is to turn one around. So this one is going to be at the rear of the tractor and um, so it will be turned around and installed so that the hydrostat faces out and it'll be driven by this input and it'll be driven the same direction um, as um, this shaft. So this shaft is going counterclockwise on here, turn around here, it's going clockwise. So this input needs to be clockwise, then I can drive both transmissions with a single drive shaft. The engine will sit above this transmission. This will be the front, this will be the front. The engine will sit above this and will drive this common drive shaft by a pulley which will be driven by the either the PTO on the engine which can be engaged and disengaged can drive this pulley or a pulley here or perhaps um, a double pulley with a tensioner on the on the belt or belts so those decisions yet to be made but it does, the decision on the orientation of the two transmissions in here does drive decisions on how to configure the transmission so they'll work. The hydrostats turn the circular motion of this input shaft into infinitely variable output to a um, gear in that drives the gear case so there's a pinion output from the um, hydrostat into the gear case and when I get this other gear case open I'll show you um, what it looks like and it can be driven either f the input here is always counterclockwise the output of the pinion into the gear case can be um, either clockwise or counterclockwise in other words forwards or reverse and that's controlled by um, this plate here on the side of the hydrostat. Maybe I can move this one more easily. Let's go over to the one on this hydrostat. So this is that same arm that has the spring in here. And the, the reason I can't move this is because it's attached to, um, well, this will move it. On the side of the hydrostat is the trunnion. And this trunnion arm, it pivots and has a shaft which goes through the hydrostat. And on inside the hydrostat is a plate which pivots forward and backwards. And that controls the displacement of the pump section of the hydrostat. The displacement goes to the motor side, which is down below, which drives the pinion gear, which drives the transmission. So the hydrostat is actually a hydraulic pump and motor combination in one housing. This controls the direction of the motor. The pump runs one direction constantly, counterclockwise. This lever here controls the swash plate which directs the fluid to the motor section and runs it in either forward or reverse. So in forward this swash plate goes back in reverse it's pulled forward. The swash plate is um, built with a boss on it which limits its motion in reverse. So these tractors are designed to have about eight miles an hour speed forward max and about 
four or five miles an hour backwards. And that's because of the limitations on the swash plate. So my plan is to modify the swash plate to permit the same speed forward and reverse. Now the tractor, the dozer won't go eight miles an hour because the drive train won't be 24 inch diameter wheels. It'll be a 12 inch diameter sprocket. So you're really talking about half that speed. So the estimated forward speed of the dozer would be four miles an hour. And in reverse, we want to have the same speed. It's important to have the same speed in reverse as forward because as I mentioned, this transmission will be turned around backwards. So it will be running backwards um, while the front transmission is running forward. It doesn't matter. It doesn't care whether it's running backwards or forwards. It has the same capacity either direction. It's just the way the fluid is directed to the um, motor side of the hydrostat. So I just wanted to explain that because the first thing we're going to do is pull the hydrostat off of this transmission and modify the swash plate to verify that we can achieve this approximately the same speed forward or back. You can see there's not a lot of motion on here. So we're only looking at an additional, you know, quarter inch or three eighths of an inch of movement of this um, trunnion arm. All right. So we can do, we need to do this before we drain in order to do the rest of the work on the transmission. We need to drain, drain it. And it's full of hydraulic fluid, about seven quarts of hydraulic fluid. So when we go to pull the axle shaft to modify it and weld the spider, you know, we'll have to drain the fluid, but I'd like to make the change to the hydrostat first before we um, drain the fluid because it needs fluid to work. So we're going to tip it up on end, pull the hydrostat off and um, take it to the bench and work on the, the trunnion. All right, removing the hydrostat starts with taking the filter off. And to be honest with you, I don't remember whether this hyd um, hydrostat has fluid in it or not. Um, So nine sixteenths socket This is the brake arm, brake actuator for internal brakes. This arm here. Um, we're not going to use it, so I'm just going to remove it now. This pin, this bolt, is a pin which goes through a cross slot in the pivot shaft. So that bolt goes through that groove in the shaft to hold the shaft in position. This arm comes out of the way. There's a um, piston, an input here for the um, that presses against a brake pad inside the, the housing. So we'll have to see about either have to replace that to plug this up. We'll see what we need to do there. Any case, 
that gets that arm out of the way. Undo these other bolts. All right, so there's one, two, three, four, five, six that hold the hydrostat on. And then the suction line. Throwing stuff in the bucket. <laughs> um, See if we can lift this off. There we go. So here you can see the um, gear which is driven by the pinion output of the hydrostat and this gear of course turns the turns the um, bevel gear which drives the ring gear which drives the the axles all right let's go over to the workbench the service manual is important to have if you're going to work on these hydrostats. The disassembly and reassembly uh, process and method is pretty important. If you get it back together wrong, uh, it, it won't work. Okay, so we need to remove this front housing and um, the housing is held on partially by the charge pump. The charge pump provides, um, takes suction from the filter and sends hydraulic fluid into the um, pump section of the hydrostat. And it provides hydraulic fluid at about 600 PSI. On, this is not a ported pump, the other pump we have on the on the other the other end of the tractor from the 1450 has outputs hydraulic outputs and they're really output from the charge pump. So this is the charge pump housing. This has to come off and go back on in the exact the exact way. If you rotate it 180 degrees when you put it back on, it will not work. Okay, so it's important that you match mark it so that it goes back on the same way it came off. All right, so I have had this one apart before, and I have um, filed lines over on this side of the housing to, um, on the charge pump cover as well as on the housing cover. So I have match marks on here. So we can take the charge pump off. It's important to have a perfectly clean work area. So I've got some paper towels down. This, these are five eighths. So 
Be careful when you pull this off, you come straight up, leaving the pump gear in position. The pump gear comes straight off and then there's a small drive pin which goes in the pump gear. So it's actually a gear pump and so the charge pump will go back on it in the same orientation that it came off. These four bolts are 9 16 and then two up here at the top are actually 3 8 You need a 12 point socket that's 3 8 to fit these last two bolts. back to 9 sixteenths okay you see the cover just popped up so it is under spring tension the piston blocks well, I'll show you those when we get this open have springs in them so that um, they're kept under spring tension. If your um, piston blocks don't spring up when you undo these bolts, then you've got broken springs in your piston block. Okay, so we'll take this cover off. We need to be careful we don't drop the valve plates. There's two valve plates. Come straight up. And they stayed on here. Okay, so we'll put the housing down there. So these two valve plates, um, this is the pump section, so this is the input shaft, and this is the motor section, so this is the output. This is the swash plate pivoting underneath the motor. Let's go down and take a look at that. So the swash plate is uh, underneath the pump section, the pump motor block. So these valve plates have to go on, back on in the exact orientation that they come off. So if you can't mix them up um, or the pump won't work, so, or the hydrostat won't work. So in order to avoid mixing them up, we'll put them on the cover in the same orientation that they came off. Okay, so the cover here came off just like this. So we'll take the valve plates off, turn them over, and put them in their normal positions. There's fluid on these plates, and they're stuck together by the fluid. All right, and the plates click into position on the cover. All right, they're, they're pinned in position, so they don't rotate. So they're stationary to the cover. All right, so these are the, these are the piston blocks. This is the input. And um, on the underside of this are the pistons. We'll pull this out and then we'll remove the, the swash plate.
All right, making sure that your hands are clean. Don't want to contaminate, since this is full of hydraulic fluid normally, and you don't want to contaminate it. Remove the, I'm going to hold this piston block, the motor piston block in, and remove the pump piston block. I'm hoping it's going to come out with all the pistons in it. And of course it didn't. Alright. Well, so all the pistons fell out. So you can see that this um, piston block allows the pistons to go up and down. And these are called slipper feet, the little brass ends that are fitted to the end of the pistons, called slipper feet. And the slippers run on the swash plate. Now this swash plate pivots the one underneath this the motor section does not pivot, it's slanted. So when you move the trunnion, and move, which moves the swash plate, it changes which side of this piston block the pistons move in and, at, move in and out of. It controls the displacement either at, uh, at one side of the rotation or the other side of the rotation depending on which way this is. This block is spinning 3600 RPM roughly engine speed and it pumps fluid to the motor and then the motor moves one way or the other and depending on which way it moves it drives the output. Um, the slipper feet on it are a push against a fixed um, plate and because that plate's fixed then the motion of the slippers rotates the, the, the piston block. I'll put a description in the down below for a written explanation of how a hydrostat works. Um, it's a pretty good pretty good description. Of course the service manual also gives you um, a pretty good explanation of how the hydrostat works. Okay, next th step is to remove the swash plate. With the hydrostat body back sitting in the vise here, using a 3 16 pin punch. This is actually a, actually this is a 5 30 seconds roll pin punch. And a roll pin has a little round uh, nub which sticks out of the end. And this is what you want to use for driving roll pins. Um, put a piece of tape which is 15 30 seconds from the end. Just, just under half an inch. And that gives us a guide for how far to drive the pins. All right, I'm going to give it a little bit more. All right, 
so the trunnion shaft comes out along with the washer. So that's one side of the swash plate. Now you notice that the pin now is completely inside the shaft. So when we go to reinstall it, we'll drive it, um, we actually we'll drive it out all the way and then we'll rein reinstall it. All right, we do the other side. The risk is if you drive the pin too far, it will go into the other side of the swash plate. It'll stick out the other side of that shaft and you won't be able to reach it. So it's important to be careful that you don't overdrive it. Get a screwdriver here. Just a little bit more. You need to just sneak up on it. All right, so that worked. It freed up the other half of the trunnion shaft. At least I think it did. Okay, there, got it out. And again, that roll pin needs to be completely inside that shaft or you can't get it out. Okay, that's the other side. So this is then So this is the swash plate. And when we take it out, let's observe which side has the boss. So it was in with the boss, this boss, down. You notice this side is thinner. Let me see if I can get you a better, better shot of that. So you'll notice right here, it's a, the boss is thin and here it protrudes out, okay? So this boss, these bosses limit the travel of the swash plate. And because there's a boss here, the swash plate does not move as far in this direction. Um, and so it limits the reverse speed. So my plan is to remove this boss and make it look like this one. 
so that the speed in reverse will not be will be the same as the speed in forward. In other words, this boss will not be there. The swash plate will be able to move a little bit further. You notice it's probably only well we'll measure it, but it looks like you know maybe an eighth of an inch or maybe even less. So we'll measure it and then we'll take this to the mill and we'll mill this this off. Okay, so that's that's the next next task. I've got the swash plate mounted in the vise here. I'm using the two um, shafts, the one that came with it and the spare one I had, to um, align it in, in this plane. So since they're sitting on the, the vise jaws, and then I've um, set this plane, this surface parallel to the surface of the vise. And I have a couple of little um, machinist jacks underneath it to hold it in position. So this is the surface we're going to mill and we're going to take off uh, 230 thousandths from this surface. Now I mean it's the orientation of the surface is really not critical. Um, it's simply to limit the motion, the movement of the swash plate in the hydrostat. But um, you know, we'll get it close. So it's close right now to be in parallel to the vice surface. So using a couple of machinist squares, I've squared it up. take let's just take a light cut at first we'll take 20 thousandths off Alright, so I wanted to take a real light cut at first. That was just 20 thousandths. I'm continuing to take passes on the mill to reduce the height of the uh, boss on the back of the swash plate. Take several passes here. The way this uh, swash plate is cast, the um, right side in this in the image here 
is actually beveled a little bit in the casting. So the uh, milling operation goes a little bit past just the boss area into the casting itself, but that's fine. All we're doing here is removing the um, area of the back of the swash plate, which limits its um, ability to pivot within the housing. So we're milling it down to the required thickness. Removed the swash plate from the mill and degreased it. Used um, some bright clean to remove all the oils and um, metal chips. And here on the um, bench, we're going to reinstall it in the um, hydrostat. I'm putting some hydraulic fluid on the swash plate. This is the um, slip, the plate which the slipper feet run on, so that gets back into the swash plate again. Some more hydraulic fluid. Um, set it down in the um, hydrostat housing, and um, then begin to install the two uh, trunnion shafts. The orientation is no longer important on the swash plate. In the normally, you would install it so that the um, thin side boss faces um, up or away from the motor section. But here, since both sides swash plate are thin, relatively thin anyway, um, it doesn't matter the orientation. Install the two shafts, uh, get the shafts in position, get the um, shafts slid into the bores on the swash plate. On both sides, the swash plate is aligned. Then use a pin punch to align the holes in preparation for driving pins in. You have to wiggle the shaft around or the plate around a little bit to locate the holes in the, in the shaft. can install the pins. Um, they tap in pretty easily. They're small pins. So here I'm tapping it in flush and then recess it just a tiny bit, uh, 32nd of an inch. The shafts and uh, swash plate, there's not a lot of stress on these um, joints, so the pin going about halfway into the shaft is plenty to hold the um, swash plate in position. So the two pins go in, set them just below the surface. The swash plate um, pivots in both directions equally. I actually put a straight edge across the um, face of the housing and measured with the, uh, the uh, distance that the swash plate moves from the surface of the housing down to the swash plate. And it's the same on both sides within about 10 thousandths. Um, so I'm confident that the motion of the swash plate certainly will be close enough to uh, give some additional speed in reverse on um, the transmission. Getting ready to put the 
piston block back in. A little bit of hydraulic fluid to lubricate it. It's always a challenge getting these things in and out because the pistons tend to fall out of the, mo of the piston blocks if you're not careful. But um, that went right, right back in. Right, a little bit of more hydraulic fluid just to keep everything lubricated. Get our hands clean. Get ready to put the, uh, that cover back on. The valve plates are um, stuck to the cover. Uh, the easiest way to do this, since you have to invert this and um, turn it over to reinstall it, uh, is to put a little bit of grease on the valve plates to hold them in, in position. And as I mentioned earlier, I've had this apart recently, um, doing a different repair to it, and uh, there's still some grease on the back of those valve plates. So they're stuck pretty well to the, um, to the cover. Taking off the old gasket. I mean, I had just put that gasket on recently, probably six months ago when I had this thing apart, but I got a new gasket anyway, and we'll go ahead and change it just to be safe. Um, usually have a couple of these gaskets on hand. I think this is the last one I have. we got to pull apart another, the other transmission, the other hydrostat to do the same modification. I'm probably not going to show that uh, in the videos, but uh, so I need to order another gasket. And I'm just putting a little fluid on the surface to hold the gasket stuck to the cover because we have to turn this upside down when we install it. So those plates are pinned, and since we have to turn it over, we want to make sure they um, stay. So. You'll see my fingers on the underside of this cover when I invert it to hold it in place. The piston blocks spin against these against these plates. These plates are stationary. The holes, the slots in these plates are actually what diverts the fluid, controls the fluid flow between the pump and the motor section. So their orientation um, is uh, important. All right, so we turn it over. Hang it on to the plates underneath it. Until I discovered the little grease trick to hold the plates in position, it was pretty challenging getting it back on. So now it sits on there, and because the piston blocks are spring-loaded, a bit of space between the cover and the main housing, and that allows you to look in with a flashlight just to make sure the valve plates are um, centered on top of the piston blocks. And the one with the input shaft really you know, can't go anywhere else. Um, you want, once you check that, then you're ready to insert the bolts and um, snug the, the cover back down. It compresses the spring loaded box, trying to keep everything clean. Next step is to install the charge pump and um, we put the little pin in the shaft, which drives the uh, little inner gear, and there's a second gear, which is really actually stuck inside the cover, well, there it is, um, goes on, and um, the shaft, of course, drives that inner gear within, the, within this outer gear, so together they constitute a, a small gear pump. And we put the housing cover, the charge pump cover back on, make sure that your match marks align. Uh, 
as I mentioned, if you put it on 180 degrees out, it'll, it'll work. There's also an O-ring in the cover, and um, that's a new one that was put on just recently. I'm going to reuse it. Uh, if it's old, you uh, may replace it. You probably should replace it. If you pinch it, putting it on, then again, the pump won't work. So um, you, know, you want to make be careful when you do that. It's sometimes a little uh, fussy getting that those gears underneath the cover in the right position so the cover um, fits down over and um, just moving it around a little bit underneath the underneath the cover until the cover drops down over the the gears. The gears are eccentric so they move side to side. And I don't know, it might actually be easier to put a little bit of grease on that outside gear and stick it inside the cover and um, I don't know, I haven't tried that. Playing with its position here, trying to get it centered um, so that the cover slips down. There's actually needle bearings and a um, oil seal in the in the cover here at the input shaft. Um, if you know Sometimes these seals will leak. I've never seen one leaking. The um, this one here in the charge pump is the, has, you know, the high speed input shaft, so that would be more likely to leak. The trunnion shaft seals, since there's very little movement generally, um, I don't see them leaking very often. Torque these charge down the torque spec for these bolts all these bolts is about 30 foot pounds the service manual um, has that spec in it it has a table of specs for all these bolts get the last couple of 3 8 inch bolts The suction tube will tighten that up when we get it back attached to the transmission. I'm going to put it back on the transmission immediately. We've got work to do on the, the transmission, the rear end. So that'll be the next task. I'm putting this filter back on. I had put this filter on um, when I had it apart last time, so it's actually um, this hydroset has not been run since I last. Um, was working on it. Put the filter back on to keep it clean. And when we go to start it up, fill it with fluid, we'll take the filter off and fill it up with fluid. Look who we have here. Is this my Butchie? That's my Butchie. And here comes Brutus. Of course, both of them. Got to get in on the act. What are you guys doing, huh? You being good puppies? You being my good boys? Yeah. My good boys. My good boys. All right. Now that we've got the hydro back together here, um, sitting on the bench. The next task will be to work on the rear end. So this is the cast iron rear end that we're going to put in place of the aluminum rear end here in this um, this end of the frame. And um, we're going to cover the uh, modifications to the rear end which will include um, welding the spider and removing one of the drive shafts and turning the splines off the drive shaft. So what we're 
modifying this rear end to be, um, since it's an open differential, if you stop one wheel from spinning, the other one will spin. So we can't have that. We want to limit drive to one particular side of the differential. So welding the spider will ensure that normally it would drive both axles, both sides of the differential simultaneously. But if we turn the splines off of one axle shaft, then it will just float. It'll just spin. Um, it won't have any drive. So what we'll do by making that modification is restrict the rear end to driving only one side of the axle, one axle, one side of the differential, and the other side will be just free floating or um, free spinning. Uh, so we'll, we need to do that so that each of these differentials drives one track. So the rear one drives the left track, the right one drives, the front one drives the right track. Um, so we're doing it to both, we're gonna do it to both transmissions. And by modifying the um, hydrostat as we did, we'll get the same speed forward and reverse in both um, hydrostats. So we got to make that same hydrostat modification to the other hydrostat. I, I'm not going to not going to video that since it's the same as what we already did. But in any case, that's where we are. I'm going to wrap up this episode uh, at this point, and we'll pick up next time with modifications to uh, this differential. So appreciate you guys watching. Hit the thumbs up and subscribe if you haven't already. If you have friends that are interested in Cub Cadets or fabrication, custom build, stuff like this, um, go ahead and share the video if you can. And I um, appreciate you watching. We'll see you guys next time.